Bill Dick. Okay, it's good to have everybody in, and again, we always like to let our television folks know that this is our once-a-month taping session, and uh, we're going to be producing, Lord willing, four programs this afternoon. And uh, for those of you joining us on television, we just again want to thank you for your response by way of phone calls and letters and your financial help. We just uh, stand amazed at God's grace because, as I've said so often, we never dreamed that this would go more than to the Tulsa audience in maybe six months and it would die a natural death. But uh, the Lord has just seen fit to sort of extend it out. And uh, now, of course, we've got a nationwide audience and how we do thank the Lord for all that's been accomplished. And as I've said so often, we couldn't do it without you folks that come in to the studio every month. And so we just praise the Lord for everything. Now, again, I guess I have to always remind folks that everything that uh, has been produced earlier is now available on videotapes and the printed little books as you see on the screen. And uh, if you're interested in any of that, you just give us a call or drop us a note and we'll get the information to you. All right, now we're in the book of Galatians and in our last program we had gotten up to about verse 8 or 9 in Galatians chapter 2. But I always like to make constant uh, review and uh, a little bit of reminder of why this little letter was written. And remember the whole theme of this little letter to the Galatian church is we're not under law, we're under grace. And that, of course, is a statement that came straight from the lips of the Apostle Paul, first and foremost, up until that time. That was an unknown tenet. And uh, as we're going to see here, even, even Peter, for the most part, and the eleven had no comprehension of this great move of God to come away from Israel and the covenant promises and all that was attended to that and go out to the whole wide world, black and white, rich and poor, east and west, regardless, Jew or Gentile, with this tremendous gospel of the grace of God. And we don't know it until we get, to, of course, to Paul. And uh, this is hard for a lot of people to swallow. In fact, I was just reading a gentleman again the other day for whom I've had a lot of respect, but I couldn't agree with him when he said, now, after all, there is no difference between Peter's message and Paul's. Why, goodness sakes, there's so much difference. It's daylight and dark. Maybe it just takes common lay people to see that. huh? It, it could be. But uh, anyway, as we're going to see later on in this chapter, you see, there was that, that difference of opinion and that Peter had a hard time, as we'll see later, as he wrote in his second epistle, that in the things written by Paul are things hard to be understood. Well, why? Well, because, you see, he came out of that Jewish background under the covenant promises, under the law, and uh, nothing had changed except that their Messiah had made his appearance and he had presented himself to Israel as their king and their redeemer and their Messiah. And for the most part, the nation rejected it. Oh, sure, several thousand, of course, uh, came around to it. But on the whole, the nation of Israel rejected Christ at his first advent. They crucified him. And again, in the book of Acts, the same thing. Peter appeals to the nation of Israel over and over to still repent of the fact that they had crucified their Messiah, but that God had raised him from the dead and that he was alive and still in a position to come back and be their king. But Israel rejected it. Israel went on in unbelief until finally in Acts chapter 9, of course, God did something again that was supernatural when he saved that, that arch-religionist, that zealot, Saul of Tarsus, and immediately made the announcement, I will send you far hence to the Gentiles. And of course, that's when everything began to change. And that's why then he had to make that graphic statement in Romans chapter 6 that we're not under law, we're under grace. But the moment he started having Gentile converts under his gospel, the Judaizers from Jerusalem began to undermine it. And we're still trying to convince these Gentiles that, but you have to keep the law of Moses. You have to be circumcised and you have to do these things. And so the Galatians were falling to that. And Paul even makes the stringent statement. In fact, come back to Galatians chapter 1 for just a quick review. In Galatians 1, what a statement. And it is just as apropos today as it was the day he wrote it. 
Because even though it may not be circumcision that we're dealing with, we still have all these other aspects of legalism that Paul had to confront here, especially to the Galatians. Now, it's interesting. In fact, I told someone the other day, I'm so thankful that we did teach First and Second Corinthians before we came to Galatians. Now, I know that's the way it sets in the format, and that's as the Holy Spirit intended it. But I can see why. Because, you see, all the things that he wrote to the Corinthian churches in those first two letters were not so much a failure in their doctrine as it was a failure in their practice. They were having divisions, and they were def uh, being divided as to who was the true apostle. But it wasn't so much a doctrinal thing. But now when you get to Galatians, it's not the practice, it's the doctrine. And look what he says in chapter 1, verse 6. He says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him who called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert. See, it was a perversion of the gospel that was afflicting these Galatian churches. And so they would pervert the gospel of Christ. And then look at this tremendous statement in 8 and 9. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that we have preached, let him be what? Accursed. Now, you know what that means in Scripture? That means an eternal separation, not, not, not just a punishment for six months. That is an eternal separation. And he repeats it in verse 9. As we've said before, so say I now again, if any preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, that is, from this man Paul, let him be accursed. And so he goes on then to show how that God supernaturally reached down and saved him by grace, taught him for three years out in the desert down at Mount Sinai, and then didn't send him back to the Twelve to pick up everything that they knew, which most people, I suppose, imagine, that Paul was just an extension of Peter and the Eleven's ministry. Heavens, no! My, the Holy Spirit, through the pen of the Apostle Paul, makes it so plain that there had to be a total break between the twelve and this man's ministry. Now we pick it up, if you'll go on with me a little further in chapter 1, in verse 11 and 12. This is all review, but we always have to remember we've got new people coming in every week, and uh, I've got to review. And even for those who have heard it ten times, they still call and say, don't ever stop reviewing. So uh, I'm not going to apologize for this, but chapter 1, now verse 11, he says, And I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which is preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation or the revealing from Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to show how the Lord had to supernaturally save him on the road to Damascus and took him down into Arabia for three years. And then in chapter 2, where we left off last week, he is now again being confronted by what I call the wheels in Jerusalem. Now, I don't do that to, to make any snide remark, because that's what they were. In our vernacular, they were the wheels. They, they were the head men of the Jerusalem church. They were the twelve and some of the other, and it was Jewish. And I maintain, and I've said it over and over and over on this program, that those Jewish believers there at Jerusalem were still basically law keepers. And they had not comprehended Paul's gospel of grace. And I've shown my reasons for saying that. Peter, at the vision of the sheet, says, Not so, Lord. I'm not going to eat any of those animals. Why? Because I've never gone contrary to the law. I eat kosher. I have never eaten anything common or unclean. Well, what is that? That's law. And then he went to the, to the threshold of Cornelius. And ere he walked in, what did he say to Cornelius? He said, now you know, you've been in Israel long enough in your military service. You've been around us. You know it's an unlawful thing for me, a Jew, to keep company with a man of another nation. Well, now, if Peter understood Paul's gospel of grace, that wouldn't have even crossed his mind. He should have been thrilled to death to go into the house of a military officer. But see, it was bugging him. And here he was a good Jew, and according to the law, he couldn't go in there. But, of course, God had made it plain that this is what he wanted. And so this was the whole controversy, as we saw in our last program, or maybe in the last two, how that 
these Jewish emissaries from Jerusalem were undermining Paul's little congregations wherever he went. Corinth, just as much. Remember, he had to defend his apostleship constantly in the Corinthian letters. Why? Because the Jerusalem people were saying, well, you're, you're just something that's gone out on his own. You haven't got any official recognition from Peter and the eleven. But Paul says, I don't need any official recognition from Peter. I got mine from the one who's in charge. I got mine from the Lord in heaven. But, oh, they couldn't understand that, see? And so, now let's just pick it up in chapter 2, about where we left off. We, we kind of hurriedly ended it last, last program, but let's just pick it up in about, uh, oh, let's see, verse 5. And this hits us directly. If it were not for this verse, you and I as Gentiles would still be out there in paganism. But this man stuck to his guns. Verse 5 of Galatians 2. To whom, that is, the leaders in Jerusalem, we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour. For what purpose? That the truth of the gospel, Paul's gospel, the gospel of grace, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Who are the you? Gentile, see? But of those who seemed to be somewhat. Now I explained that in the last program. Why did they seem to be somewhat? Well, at one time they were. They were somewhat. They were the leaders. And I went back and showed you in the book of Acts that all of those Jewish believers in that Jerusalem congregation had land and houses and CDs and stocks, whatever else they may have had. And they sold it. They turned it into cash. And what did they do with it? laid it at the apostles' feet. Why? Because they were in charge. Then even old Barnabas, it says, good old Barnabas had land on the island of Cyprus, and he sold it. What did he do with the resources? Brought it right back to Jerusalem and laid it at the feet of the apostles. Why? Because they were in control. See? All right. But now you see some... Uh, 14, oh, I've always said it, about 22 years after Pentecost. It's a long time. 20, 22 years after Pentecost. Now Paul writes by inspiration, they still thought they were the somewhat, but they weren't because their power base was slipping away. God was turning away from the Jews and he was going out now to the Gentile world. And so this is why he says what he says. They who seem to be somewhat, who still thought they were in control. But whatsoever they were maketh no matter to me. God accepts no man person. Reading on in verse 6. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference when they really sat down and laid line upon line and precept upon precept, who was above and who was beneath. Well, Paul took the ascendancy and the twelve in Jerusalem had to finally admit, okay, Paul, you're right. Evidently, the Lord is doing something different. Now, I'm not taking anything away from the twelve spiritual relationship with God. Nothing at all. It was just that God had not yet re revealed to those Jewish believers at Jerusalem that he was doing something different. You know, I'm always going back to Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. And what does that mean? God can keep in his mind whatever he wants to keep it, and he will reveal it whenever he's good and ready and not until. And so he kept all these things secret. But then Deuteronomy 29 goes on to say that once it's revealed, then we are to believe it. See? All right, now Peter and the eleven, of course, were in that position that God had not revealed it to them. So I'm not blaming them of being out of step with God or being less spiritual. No, no. It was just that God had not yet revealed to those Jewish believers that now he's doing something totally different. In fact, that word, let me show you. Turn over with me to Ephesians, uh, Philippians. Ephesians, next after Philippians, uh, Galatians, and then Philippians, chapter 1. It's an interesting little verse. Most people, I suppose, miss it completely. <coughs> Philippians, chapter 1, verse 10. 
And again, remember the letter to the Philippians is to a Gentile congregation. Well, let's just read verse 9 first. And this I pray, Paul writes, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment or discernment, and that you may approve things that are... Now, the King James says excellent, but that particular Greek word is translated different in every other portion that I'm aware of in the New Testament. Now, why did they change it here? I don't know. But read it in that light. Oh, that you may approve things that are different. How different? Well, as different as night and day. Oh, the same God. But now a whole new body of truth is being revealed that had never been mooted before. And I've reminded our, our audience now and, and most of you in my classes for years. Goodness sakes, was there anything in Christ's earthly ministry that spoke of a Gentile body of Christ? Not a word. Was there ever a word that the Holy Spirit would indwell individual believers? Not a word. Was there anything in Scripture that the blood of Christ had atoned for all the sins of the whole world? Not a word. Oh, it was all back there in latent language, but to just come right out and say it? No, you can't find it until you get to Paul. In the same way with this whole doctrine of the rapture of the church, and this is what throws a curve at people. You won't find it anywhere but Paul because it is uniquely a church phenomenon. And Israel knew nothing of such a thing. The Gentile pagan world certainly didn't know such a thing. But you see, it was revealed to this apostle because all these items within this body of truth are so totally different than anything that ever been revealed before. For example, the word justification just come to mind. It'll probably come a little later in our study in Galatians. Can you see a place in all of Scripture where it says, and you can be justified from all things by just simple faith in the gospel? No, it's not in there. Now, I know, I think it's Amos, it says, the just shall live by faith. And it was on that premise, of course, that Martin Luther uh, made his move. The just shall live by faith. But to take it in the context that Paul teaches it, it was unknown, totally unknown. It was a secret, secret held in the mind of God. All right, back to Galatians, chapter 2. But now verse 7. Now, this is still a repeat from our last program. But contrary wise, and I always put it in our own vernacular. How do we put it? On the other hand. Isn't that what we say? Sure. But on the other hand. When they, the twelve and the Jerusalem leadership, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision. What does uncircumcision mean in the Bible? Gentile. See? So just put that word in there. You won't do any violence to Scripture. So when the gospel of the Gentiles was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision or the Jew... The gospel of the Jew was, and put in the verb, committed unto whom? Peter. And that's when they suddenly realize that here we have two, I put it last program, a fork in the road. Here we'd been coming down Jew only, Jew only, Jew only, with a few exceptions, but it was Jew only ever since Abraham back in Genesis 12. And now all of a sudden in Acts chapter 9, God says, I'm going to do something different. It's just like a fork in the road. And, of course, we usually teach uh, the book of Acts as transitional. Not a complete break from Judaism and uh, the Jewish Christians, but nevertheless, there's that bridging over now then from God dealing with Israel to his dealing with the Gentiles. And so this is what they're finally seeing, that the gospel of the Gentile was committed unto Paul as the gospel of the Jew was committed unto Peter. And you can never tell me that it was the same gospel. There is no way you can show me the gospel of the grace of God in Christ's earthly ministry or as Peter preaches in Acts. It's just not in there. If you can find it in your Bible, you show it to me. You show me at break time. If I had a lot of money, I would just be uh, uh, brusque enough. I'd say, listen, I'll give you $1,000 if you can show it to me. I haven't got that kind of money. But whatever, it's just not in there, see? 
you can't find it. And so here they're recognizing this great difference of operation. All right, then verse 8. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision. See how plain that is? The same God. That's implied. I know the word God isn't in there, but it's implied. The same God or the same Christ was mighty in me, not toward the circumcision, but toward what people? Gentile. See the difference? Then verse 9. Now remember, this is 20 years after Pentecost. This isn't just a day or two later. This is 20 years later. And when James and Peter and John. Now, I don't like to put a lot of emphasis on the order of names, but there is a certain degree of it. Who's listed first? James. Now, the casual reader won't catch that. But what's happened? Peter has lost something. You remember I told you in our last program that uh, back in Acts chapter 15 when the consul was raging in Jerusalem with arguing over whether these Gentiles had to keep the Jewish law, and it says, after there had been much disputing, Peter rose up. And what did Peter tell him? Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute, a long time ago, God used me to speak to Gentiles, and he was referring to the house of Cornelius, but you know how long that long time was? It was 12 years. It had been 12 years since Peter had gone to the house of Cornelius. Well, you would have thought that when he saw the amazing conversion of those pagan Romans, now, of course, there weren't hundreds of them, it was just a household, but nevertheless, the evidence was there that they had been saved without any of the attending ramifications of Judaism or any of that. You'd have thought that Peter would have gone right back to Jerusalem and said, Hey, fellas, let's get out of this place. The Gentiles are beginning to wake up. But does he? No. He goes back to Jerusalem and gets called on the carpet, of course, for having gone to a Gentile. And there they stay. There they stay. Why? Well, God had not yet permitted them to move any further than their ministry to what it says here as apostleship of the nation of Israel. So now verse 9 again. So when not Peter, James, and John, but James and Peter and John. Peter is now in second place. And we'll also find that James was the moderator when we get down a few more verses. And so who seemed to be pillars, there's that word seem to be again. They weren't, but they thought they were. And so these who seemed to be pillars perceived the grace that was given unto me when all of a sudden the Lord opened their eyes that Paul had a unique apostleship of which they could not be a part except admit it. All right, read on. And so they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship. What did they do? like we do today. They shook on the whole deal. They shook hands and said, all right, Paul, you and Barnabas go on back to your Gentile field and we'll stay here amongst the Jews. And so he says that we should go to the heathen, to the Gentiles, and they, Peter and James and John and the others, would still continue where? The circumcision. See that? It's in your Bible. If you read it, and they agreed that they would stay with the circumcision, the Jews. Verse 10, but they're going to put some strings on it, which is all right. They're going to put some strings on this agreement. They said, all right, Paul, we'll agree that you can continue to preach to your Gentile converts. They won't have to keep the law of Moses. They won't have to practice circumcision, but we're going to add some strings. And here is one of them. They would that we should remember the poor. <clears throat> now you want to remember, they had a bunch of poor Jews there in Jerusalem <coughs> who had sold all their property, and the kitty had run out after 20 years, and so now they're destitute, they're poor. But God isn't going to abandon them. And so God, by the guidance of the Holy Spirit, inspired Paul and Barnabas, of course, that as they circulated amongst those Gentile churches, they would take collections and offerings for 
those poor Jews in Jerusalem. Now we always have to qualify that with Scripture. Come back with me again to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. And if you find that before the rest of us find it, you can go to uh, 1 Corinthians, I think it is, the last chapter. I hope it is, or I'm in trouble. Yeah. Romans 15, and dropping down to verse 25. Romans 15, verse 25. And look what he says. But now I go to Jerusalem to minister to the saints, the Jewish believers. For it hath pleased them of Macedonia, that is northern Greece, and Achaia, southern Greece, to make a certain contribution for the poor saints, where? At Jerusalem. See? That's what the whole idea, that when they got the permission from the twelve to go ahead and preach this gospel, but remember these poor Jewish believers in Jerusalem. All right, come on over to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Might as well start with verse 1. Chapter 16, verse 1. Now, concerning the collection, the offerings. I'm in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1. Now, concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Now verse 2, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him as God hath prospered him, so that no gatherings or offerings have to be taken when I come. Speldick. Okay, it's good to have everybody back. And you know, like I had to say once before, you know, getting all these people back away from that coffee pot and cookies is not always easy. But uh, anyway, uh, we're going to move right on from where we left off in Galatians chapter 1. But uh, for those of you uh, joining us on television, again, we appreciate the fact that we seem to be succeeding in letting you feel like you're a part of our class right here in the studio. And uh, we trust that as many of you have written, you're using your Bibles and taking notes. And then uh, if you need some extra help and you want our videos or our little booklets, why they are available there. They're on the screen. We now also made them available with audio cassette. But... Uh, Whichever, we uh, do it as a service, not that we try to generate income from them. All right, let's just get right back. This, this 30 minutes always goes so fast. Come back to Galatians chapter 1 and pick up where we left off at the end of our last program. We're finally now, Peter and James and John, I mean Galatians chapter, I said 1, I'm sorry, chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, where we left off. Thank you, Andrew. I would have had everybody confused. But in Galatians chapter 2, and Peter and uh, Barnabas have finally gotten the okay from the leadership of Jerusalem that they can continue their ministry to the Gentiles, and they will continue their ministry to the Jew, but they're going to put some strings on it, as I said. Number one, that they, didn't, that they wanted Paul to remember the poor saints in Jerusalem, who remember have been there now because of the events of Acts chapter 2 and 3 and 4 where they sold all their goods with the idea that the king was coming, they wouldn't need them. And when the king was rejected and didn't come, why, they were naturally left destitute. And so God providentially is providing for them now with the offerings from Paul's Gentile converts. And we looked at that in the closing moments uh, that Romans uh, 15 and 1 Corinthians 16 designated that those offerings were for the poor saints in Jerusalem. All right, now let's just read the verse a minute, and then we'll go back to Acts, where in verse 9 of Galatians 2, when James and Peter and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace or understood the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go to the heathen or the Gentiles, and they, I'll put in the verb again, would go to the circumcision or the Jew. Verse 10, only they would that we should remember the poor, that is, the saints there in Jerusalem, <clears throat> which Paul says we were forward to do. All right, now let's come back to Acts 15, and we'll see that they also added a couple other little strings to the whole deal. In Acts chapter 15, 
And it's kind of interesting, if as we looked at it a few programs ago, that in verse 12 of Acts 15, <clears throat> after Peter has finally come to Paul's rescue, and I've always said if he wouldn't have, Paul's gospel would have died right then and there. But of course, God is sovereign. He had Peter ready now, and I maintain that's the big reason he sent him up to the house of Cornelius, is not just for the house of Cornelius, but that Peter would be in a mental position to come to Paul's defense at this conference in Jerusalem 12 years later. You know, God always sees the big picture. We see the near term, but he sees the big picture, and we're going to see another graphic illustration of that a little later in Galatians. But Peter suddenly realized that, yes, he had gone to the house of pagan Gentiles, and he hadn't brought them under the law. He hadn't introduced circumcision, and while he was yet speaking, what happened? They believed. And, of course, they didn't believe Paul's gospel. That hadn't been revealed yet, but they believed that Jesus was the Messiah of Israel, and God saved them. All right? So then uh, verse 12 of Acts 15, Then all the multitude, that is, of these Jewish believers in Jerusalem, then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. Now there's another point. You remember what 1 Corinthians says? Let's go back and look at it. It's been a long time. Hold your hand in Acts. We're going to be right back. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. And you can't escape this. It just constantly comes up in front of you. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. I'll wait until you all find it. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 22. And again, most people, I suppose, just read right over it. But what a graphic statement. <coughs> For the Jews require what? A sign. The Jews require a sign. Like Missourians, you know. And so the Jews said, unless I see a sign, I won't believe. Well, God knew that, and he put up with that all the way up through their history. Now, you know that. When, when Moses was first confronted, he was a typical Jew, and he says, God, they're not going to believe me. How do I know? And what did God have to do? Show him a sign. Throw your rod on the ground. And then when he got into Pharaoh, and the only way he could convince the children of Israel that he was legitimate, he had to do it with signs and miracles. Why have I always said Christ performed all those miracles in his earthly ministry? To prove to Israel, see? to prove to Israel who he was. And I think he so graphically showed the difference in the mindset of Jews and Gentiles. Because back in his earthly ministry, he told the citizens of Capernaum that had the people of Sodom and Gomorrah witnessed what you have witnessed, what would they have done? They would have repented in sackcloth and lashes. Why? They wouldn't have had to said, well, show us a sign. They were Gentile. They were ready to believe it for being able to hear it. But the Jews required a sign. All right, now then back to Acts 15. So again, I am positive that if Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas could not have rehearsed some miraculous signs and miracles in their ministry, the Jews would have never bought it. But since they could, according to verse 11, they were convinced. And so that's what it says. All the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul declaring, now that is Paul and Barnabas were, declaring the miracles and wonders that God had wrought amongst the Gentiles. Well, that got the Jews' attention. Now then, verse 13, so after they held their peace, that is the Jews, James answered. Now, who is the moderator? Well, you'd think it should have been Peter. Here we have a big, important conference settling something that's crucial. Peter's not the, uh, the conference uh, moderator. James is. And if I'm not mistaken, it's not even the James who was of the twelve. I think he's already been beheaded. This is the other James. So you see, Peter has slipped out of his place of being the head man, and now it's James. And now he says, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon, that is Peter, hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. 
and to disagree the words of the prophets that is written after this. That is, after calling out a people for his name, God told the prophet, I will return and build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins, and I will set it up, referring, of course, to his second coming. And then come all the way down, if you will, to verse 19. Wherefore, in light of all that has just taken place, my sentence or my decision is, as the moderator, that we trouble not them who from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but, we're going to put some strings on it, we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols, from fornication, that is, immorality, and from things strangled, in other words, things that haven't been killed properly, and from blood. Now, you see, in a way it's amazing that these things were repeated, and on the other hand it isn't, because these things still hold true today. God still has never given the human race permission to do any of these things. They are still anathema to Him. And I'll show you why in just a minute. And so, verse 21 gives the reason. For Moses, that is Jews, who were still adherents of Judaism, for Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. In other words, what James say? Now look, if you're going to go out into the Gentile world and preach this gospel of grace, that's well and good, but... For the sake of Jews who are in those pagan communities, at least make your converts understand that some of these things are still fundamental going all the way back to the law of Moses. And that, of course, Paul agreed with. And I'm sure that he taught it as such. All right, verse 22. So then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church, that is, the church of Jerusalem, to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. And they wrote letters after this manner, verse 23, confirming it, that it was in writing, and no doubt they signed it, that they were no longer going to force them to keep the law and practice circumcision and so forth. And then drop down to verse 29, and the Holy Spirit has seen fit to repeat it that this was part of this written agreement that went from the Jerusalem church up to Antioch, that you abstain from meat offered to idols and from blood and things strangled and from fornication, from which if you keep yourselves you shall do well. All right, now let's go back to the Old Testament a moment and see what they were referring to. And that would be in Leviticus <coughs> chapter 17 and 18. And so even though this was part of the law, yet it was such that God could sanction its going right on long through with the gospel of grace. And I firmly believe that even though we're under grace, we're not under law. God is still holding us accountable for not doing any of these things. Now it's interesting that for those who get involved in Satan worship, this is where they begin. This is usually part of their initiation process, that they drink blood and they become immoral and all the rest of it. All right, now here's the reason. In Leviticus 17, dropping in at verse 10. Leviticus 17, verse 10. And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn among you that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood and will cut him off from among his people. Now, this is God speaking. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. Now, this is why the blood had to be sacrificed for the remission of sin. It was death for life. For the life of the flesh, verse 11, is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. But now I'm going to make a point. What had to happen to the blood in the Old Testament sacrifices, as well as Christ's blood, what 
had to be done with the blood for it to become an efficacious uh, atonement for sin. It had to be applied. See, it had to be sprinkled on the altar. It had to be sprinkled on the uh, Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat. And Christ also had to present his blood, remember, where? The Holy of Holies in heaven. See? And so it follows all the way through. And for this reason, God still demands that even under grace, we do not partake of these things. All right, then... Uh, Oh, that's enough on that. All right, now the other point was not to practice fornication or immorality. All right, now I know I've got a lot of little kids watching my program, and I'm not going to read because it it's rather graphic, but you get into chapter 18, and God explicitly lays down these various immoral sins that believers are to have nothing to do with. Why? Because, you see, in verse 3, after the doings of the land of Egypt, I'm in uh, Leviticus 18, verse 3. After the doings of the land of Egypt wherein you dwelt, that is in the slavery, you shall not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, when they came in after Joshua, whether I bring you, you shall not do. Neither shall you walk in their ordinances. You shall do my judgments, God says, and you shall keep my ordinances because I am the Lord your God. All right, then beginning of verse 6, of course, he goes down and stipulates graphically all of the immoral sins of the Canaanites and the Egyptians and which believers were to have nothing to do. And that's still applicable. I mean, just because we're under grace doesn't mean that we're now free to eat blood and practice immorality or worship idols. Absolutely not. Those things are, as the German would say, verboten. They're forbidden. And we better remember that. All right, now I'll come back to Galatians chapter 2. We're going to come to an interesting situation. And I always have to clarify myself, lest I be accused of not having a warm place in my heart for Peter. Yes, I do, because I understand Peter's position. Peter was still steeped in legalism. Peter still had not had his eyes totally open to these Pauline truths. And so Peter was in perfect accord with his Lord as far as it went. And I'm not taking anything away from the man's spiritual aspect whatsoever ever, but he could not comprehend what it was to be totally out from under the law. And so now sometime after the Jerusalem Council, and this has all supposedly been settled, that these Gentiles under Paul's ministry who had been saved by the gospel of grace were free to eat whatever they wanted to eat. They were not under any law of dietary form whatsoever. And Peter comes up to visit the Antioch church. And now look at it. It's rather interesting. Verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, sometime after the Jerusalem council, Paul says, I withstood him to the face. Now, I think he had to get on a soapbox to do that. Because I think Peter was a big, tall Galilean, and I think Paul was pretty much a short, typical Jew. And I can just see, if Paul was face to face, he had to look up at him, but I, I say he must have jumped on a little box or something, because I can always remember back when I was farming in Iowa, I had one of the neighbor's kids who would help me. And whenever he wasn't tall enough or something, he'd throw down a bale of hay and he'd jump on it so he could look at me eyeball to eyeball, see? Well, this is what I kind of see Peter doing. He must have either jumped on something so he could look Peter in the face or else he had to look up, because I know, I'm almost positive, he was much, much shorter in stature than Peter. But, Nevertheless, what does the statement say? I withstood him to the face, publicly. See? My, that must have been an embarrassing thing for Peter. And look what goes on. And so he says, I withstood him to the face. Why? Because he was to be blamed. He was at fault. Now, this isn't the first time poor old Peter stumbled. Nor do we get to the place where we don't stumble. So again, I'm not taking anything away from Peter. He was just as human as all of us. And here he stumbled. 
And Paul called him on it. All right, verse 12. Here was the whole reason. For before, that isn't time-wise, before that certain came from James, see, who is now the head man of Jerusalem, when emissaries came to Antioch from James's congregation in Jerusalem, before that, Peter ate with Paul and those Gentile believers, regardless of what the meal was. But after these Jewish people came up from Jerusalem, what does Peter do? Hey, he's scared of them. He's afraid of them. And so to continue on and maintain the testimony of Paul's gospel of grace that he could prove to these Jews from Jerusalem, hey, fellas, we are free to eat whatever we want to eat. We are no longer under the dietary laws. We've been set free from all that. Instead of that, Paul, I mean, Peter gives in. See, isn't that a something? He gave in and refused to go in and eat with Paul's Gentile converts. Well, can you imagine what this did to the Apostle Paul? Boy, I mean, now Paul had that, that little short temper side of him. I know he did. He, he has to apologize for it. And I think Paul just got real upset with Peter. Now, Peter, you're being two-faced. That's what we'd say today. When there wasn't anybody from Jerusalem, you didn't have any problem eating with us and my Gentile converts. But as soon as those people came from Jerusalem, then you say, no, I'm a good Jew. I can't do that. And so Paul calls him on it. And so he says... He did eat with the Gentiles, verse 12, and when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, that is, from the Gentiles, fearing who? Not God, the men from Jerusalem. Now, you know, I've always given Peter credit, and I still do. Do you remember that leading up to his crucifixion and suddenly when he saw that Jesus was arrested, and the young maid thought she recognized him, and you know the account. She said, well, you're one of them. What did he do? He denied it three times. He denied it. Swore. Why? He was afraid of the powers that were. But I've always made this point, and I'll make it again. After Peter witnessed the resurrection and the power of it, what happened to him? He was a different person. He was no longer afraid of anybody. He stood up to the Jewish uh, religious leaders. He stood up to the Romans and no doubt took a martyr's death because of it. But here, as an ordinary practicing Jew, in a moment of weakness, amongst these Gentile believers, he blows his testimony again. And Paul has to call him on it. And so what does he say? Verse 13. And other Jews, because of what Peter did, other Jews dissembled or withdrew likewise with him, even to the point in so much that Barnabas, good old Barnabas, that seen everything that Paul was accomplishing among the Gentiles, even Barnabas was carried away with their dissimulation or their hypocrisy, that they couldn't eat with these Gentiles. All right. Verse 14, but Paul says, when I saw that they walked not uprightly. Peter, not walking uprightly? No, not here he wasn't. He was failing miserably. And Paul says, and when they were not walking uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, what gospel? Paul's gospel the gospel of grace, which now sets us free from these dietary rules and regulations. There is now no difference between Jew and Gentile. And Peter was not yet ready to recognize that. All right, let me show you what I'm talking about. I've mentioned before, we've used the verse on the program, but it's been a long time ago. Come back to 2 Peter. And I think this is such an enlightening verse. My, I taught for a long time before I found it, but what a verse. Dropping down in 2 Peter chapter 3 to verse 15. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. Y'all got it? 
where Peter writes. Now remember, this is just shortly before he and Paul were martyred. This isn't in the beginning of his ministry. This is way at the end. He said, all these years of being in contact with Paul and Paul's message, and still he writes by inspiration. Verse 15, 2 Peter 3, account or understand that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, has written unto you. Verse 16, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things. What things? Salvation, the gospel of grace. Speaking in them of these things in which, that is his epistles, in which are some things, what? Hard to be understood. Now you can't imagine Peter saying like that, can you? After all these years, he still can't quite comprehend what Paul is driving home. Well, I'll tell you why. He was so steeped in Judaism that it just didn't come through. And so, read on. And in some things uh, are some things hard to be understood. And he wasn't alone. My, look at the multitude that are encompassed in the last part of this verse which they that are unlearned and unstable twist. Now, what's he still talking about? Paul's epistles. And so the unstable, those who don't comprehend the scriptures, are still twisting them, as they do also the other scriptures. And then what's the conclusion? To their own destruction. And so when they ignore or they delete the writings of the apostle Paul, they are, according to Peter, signing themselves up for their own destruction. And that's exactly why Paul wrote such strong language in the first chapter, that if someone is going to preach any other gospel than his gospel, let them be accursed. Now, that's strong language. I know it is. But I didn't put it in there. The book says it. And we have to stand on it. All right, now let's just go a little bit further and then our time is gone. Verse 14. The other Jews, according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, publicly. Now, it'd be a little different if this had been privately. that if thou, being a Jew, which of course Peter and Barnabas were, if you're going to live after the manner of Gentiles, if you are going to admit that the grace of God has set you free from the law, and do not as the Jews, then why are you being, and I think it's a, it's a matter of being two-faced, if this is what you understand, that the grace of God has set everybody free from the law, then why do you still compel Gentiles to live as Jews? You see what he's saying? And listen, it's no different today. Oh, I know the, uh, the, the rhetoric is a little different, but the concept is the same, that people are adding things that do not belong to the gospel of grace, and then they wonder, why people have a hard time comprehending it. Well, it's confusion, see? 